Hi, everybody. Welcome to Scoop on Poop. Or how to do video conferencing um, and include some hands-on activities so you don't bore the kids you're trying to work with to death. Your site should have the following materials with you. You should have a sheet that looks like this. It's a two-page staple sheet that shows in color what different bones look like. You should have a teacher's guide that you can all share. Called Scoop on Poop. I have yours. You should have a pair of forceps plastic. And a small vial containing bones. <laughs> from fish. <laughs> and our speaker from Alaska Sea Life will explain to you why there's a vial of bones and fish. I want to tell you a little bit about why I asked Rachel to join us. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference, and it was basically for K-12 teachers. And they were trying to show the teachers some ways that they could inject higher education into their classrooms in a way that wasn't dull. So how do you take what could be considered dry material, transmit it to the students in a way that they'll feel engaged in what they're learning without just having them stare at a television screen the entire time. So I attended this workshop called Scoop on Poop and I thought that this was one of the best examples of how to engage students in an activity. Scoop on Poop is basically for sixth through 12th graders I suspect you could do uh, a very similar one for other grades. There are lots of different kinds of activities you can do this way where faculty members at your institution can use video conferencing technology to match up with a K-12 school district um, to work with children in a particular classroom on virtually any activity that you want. Scoop on Poop can be used for mathematics classes, for social studies classes, for English classes, for lots of different kinds of activities. There's an activity that the Food Science Department at Rutgers has developed, which I've done in person with students, a sensory testing exercise that would work just as well over the, over the video conferencing setup. So I think it's an ideal way to get the faculty engaged in working with the K-12 sector without them actually having to leave the comfort of their campuses. And as we know, faculty don't really like to leave the comfort of their campuses. I think in part because they can't get parking when they come back. <laughs> Did I hear some guffaw from someplace when I made that joke? Yes. yes. I hope. Thank, oh, thank you. <laughs> A little bit of feedback from whoever was just talking. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we're still trying to connect to Rachel. How are we doing, Matt? Uh, we prefer to get back to the uh, she's Okay, good. She said about five minutes. So we okay, so I'll keep, I'll keep dancing for a little while longer. Um, one of the other things that I will let you know about is, an act is actually three concurrent activities in the K-12 area that are going on in our region. One is the development of a database at Rutgers of faculty who are interested in working with students in K through 12. That database should be available and um, for you to look at, for you to add information to by the middle of this month. At the same time that we're doing this, the NJ Edge organization is also developing a similar database for institutions from throughout the state. And at the same time that NJ Edge is doing this, the Internet 2 regional organization, MAGPIE, is doing the same thing. <laughs> the obvious question, of course, is why aren't we all doing just one database? We've had discussions about this, and the best conclusion that we've come to is that we're going to try to develop similar search engines, um, similar search fields throughout the databases, but for political and proprietary reasons, there's a need to keep the databases separate, at least at this point in time. 
So if you search the Rutgers database and you don't find what you're looking for, there will be a link into the state database and then a link into the regional database so that eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to find what you're really looking for. So that's, what, that's part of what's going on in the area of, of K through 12 um, on the campuses. I'm sorry? None of the databases are live at this time. The first one that's supposed to go live is the one at Rutgers. Right now, um, my staff are actually working at this minute trying to get the, data, the database so that it's searchable and so that you can enter data into, the, into a form. But we've gathered the information from throughout the university. There's a few hundred entries of research centers, of uh, teaching and learning programs from individual faculty who have either done this kind of work locally and are interested in doing it using technology, or faculty who um, have not done it but would like to try it. The Rutgers database is not limited to video conferencing. We have faculty on the list who will actually travel to a location. I don't know if NJ Edge or Internet2 is going to be following that, that pattern at this time. So we'll see what happens. I think it's a good development in the state. Linking higher education with the K-12 sector is very, very important. Uh, the technology availability for K-12 is growing probably right now faster than it is in higher education. They are catching up to us. They're putting video conferencing technologies and network technologies in many, many school districts in the state. And you can get a list of the actual schools throughout the state who are attached to Verizon's uh, Access New Jersey network by going to accessnj.com. So if there's a particular school that you want to work with and you want to find out if they are linked to Access New Jersey, you go to the, to the web link, it'll give you the information, and through that you should be able to get in touch with the person at the school and try to begin a program. So far, any questions in... Uh, Camden, New Brunswick. I know you didn't all come here to listen to me, but I'm dancing right now. Um, Gail, can you mute your mic yes. for a second? I'm sorry? Can you mute your mic for a second? <laughs> I just don't, I have to mention something and there's going to be a feedback. I just got off the phone with uh, Rachel Simon from the Alaska Sea Life Center. standards. Um, the Alaska Sea Life Center set up this program to help teach a number of different scientific, mathematical, and social science um, concepts to the students. One of the things that they found that students seem to really like to play with and really like to learn about is animal scat. Uh, another word for scat, for those of you who are not familiar, is poop. What they have learned is that the sea lions off the coast of Seward, Alaska um, are impacted very strongly by changes in water temperature, in availability of food, and things like that. The number of sea lions is going down, and part of what the Alaska Sea Life Center got a grant to study is why this is happening. And so they began to look at a number of different things. They looked at water temperatures, and they had a number of experiments looking at water temperatures, and not to anyone's great surprise, the temperature is going up a little bit. Along with the temperature going up, though, is also a change in the number and size of the fish that sea lions eat. And so in order to see if they could learn something about this phenomenon, the Alaska Sea Life Center sent researchers out 
and they literally scoop up sea lion poop, scat, sorry, from the rocks. And if you have a copy of your teacher's guide, you will actually see someone scraping scat. Um, and what they then do is they bring it back to the lab, they basically sterilize it, and they take the bones from the scat and they put them in a little vial, which they send out to people to use to help them with their experiments. Now, if you pour out the contents of your vial onto the table in front of you or a chair in front of you, what you'll see is a lot of different kinds of bones. And I'd like you to do that now if you don't mind. So, I guess, yeah. Ron, this is Ron, the same time. Don wanted to do. Oh, oh, what's a camera excuse? I'm sorry, Ken. I always put the other I should make new camera. Oh, bones are out? Okay, would you like the other vial? We have two vials. Would you like to come up and get another one? So for the young grades, one of the experiments you might do is simply separating the bones and seeing how many of each kind of bone there are. So what I'd like you to do now is to start separating the bones into little piles based on the size, the shape of the bones. At the same time that you're doing that, you may want to try to match them to the diagram of the bones that you have in front of you. I think the reason that they are starting this as a 6th through 12th grade activity is that these bones are not easy to pick up with the, with the forceps. <laughs> they can learn, some of the things that, that the scientists can learn is they can determine the fish species length and weight from measuring the, the uh, bones and using formulas that are available and they can actually measure the fish's age by counting the rings on one of the specific bones. So obviously part of this experiment is to show students what the scientific method is about. You have a hypothesis that says that the fish are getting smaller, let's say. And so the first thing you want to do is look at the sizes of the bones and how many of each of the kind of bones to see which fish are still available and are they getting smaller than the last time you did this experiment. You could also do a social studies uh, experiment or activity where you talk about resource conservation and global warming and topics like that. Obviously, you could have them write stories about what the life of the sea lion might be like. You can have the students participate in debates about global warming or other kinds of topics. So what they've done at the Alaska, Alaska Sea Life Center is they've put together this teacher's guide, which is what I've been referencing. And within the teacher's guide, they explain to the teacher basically how to go through these kinds of activities. Uh, what people usually do when they hook up with Rachel in the Alaska Sea Life Center is that she'll actually show you sea lions, she'll actually talk you through the process, um, show some things that are going on at the Sea Life Center so that you feel like you're part of this environment of doing science in a real research center. And that's part of why we wanted to bring Rachel on board with us, so that we could see from, this, from the research center's perspective just how they're doing this kind of work. So how are we coming along separating our bones? Newark, how are we doing? You doing okay, Newark? Okay, well, how about Camden? How are we doing in Camden? Excellent. Okay, you're almost done? Yeah. You're done in Camden. I know Camden, I apologize, there was only one vial for you, but you can share. And, and New Brunswick, how are you doing? We're uh, we seem to be making progress here. Making progress. Okay, that sounds very positive, I must say. <laughs> so let me give you a couple more minutes to, to finish separating out and identifying the bones. 
What I'm seeing here in Newark, just as an idea of how to do it, is one of the one of the people here in Newark is actually taking the bones and putting them on top of the picture that cl most closely represents what the bone looks like. So that's one way that you could do this. Some of what you might find in with the bones is actually just sort of junk. But you'll recognize junk, it is clean junk. They really do sterilize this stuff, so don't hesitate about picking it up if you have to. There are similar experiments that you can do with owl pellets. And a lot of the younger graves will use owl pellets to do these kinds of examples. You can purchase over the internet similar kinds of kits with owl pellets. And if you hook up with your neighborhood uh, wildlife center or in New Jersey, perhaps the Raptor Trust, you can actually work with them to have them talk a little bit about the animals, show the animals, and then you can go through the same kind of exercise with owl pellets. It's very engaging to the students as they move along. Are you engaging? Oh, I'm very surprising if they broke. Okay. They're very, very, I'm sorry? We're having a little bit of trouble with the identification process, but we're working on it. Okay, I know it's difficult. Part of what happens when you ship bones through the mail is that they jiggle around a lot, and depending upon how uh, careful the, the mail people were along the way between Alaska and here, I can't guarantee how much those vials got shook up. I guess next time I can suggest to her that she pad them in some way before they go get sent. But the other thing that happens is these bones are very fragile, and even when you're doing this as a real scientific experiment, you will find parts of bones. Because as the sea lions are chomping down on them, they may be biting into the bones, they may be getting caught someplace along the way and snapping. So what you're seeing is perfectly normal for these kinds of, this kind of a situation. to the internet to learn more about sea lions and other kinds of ecological activities as part of this. Hey, what about the coloration? Coloration is likely to change, so likely to be different, but I don't think it's necessarily indicative of anything. We can check with Rachel when and if we actually get her on the line. Well, I was saying to the students that they're trying to identify <laughs> if there's any, you know, I mean, we, we just see things that are much different in color, obviously. 
you know, if she had a cell phone, she could channel Gail. I think maybe partially a fact of is that these were photographs that were taken at one point in time. That may be an issue. You may have to tell your students the bones may not be exactly the same color, but you should be looking for the same shape.
So how many fish do we have in Camden? Okay, round up. Okay, we got one in Camden. How many fish do we have in New Brunswick? Two fish. Okay, there's two vials in New Brunswick, so I should be hearing two numbers from New Brunswick. We only open one vial, two fish. Ah, okay, thank you. And Newark, how many fish do we have? How many fish does the other group in Newark have? Oh, we've, we've joined them together. Okay. So now we have a general idea of just how many fish is it's likely this particular sea lion ate. So the next thing you would do is um, look for beaks. Beaks. There are a couple of different kinds of beaks. There are squid beaks and octopus beaks. And I'm looking along with you to see if I can find the beaks. She's checking out the beaks. I'll tell you later I see the size of the data. So, of course, since we're not seeing any beaks at all in the, the diagram, and I don't know enough about squid beaks, I think we'll just pass over that and go on. We're really hopeful that Rachel will be joining us soon. How are we doing, Matt? Yeah, we haven't heard word back from her yet. We're still waiting. Okay, I'll keep the answer. I'm guessing, okay. quite frankly, I'm guessing that their network issues are going to be, uh, you know, extended. Yeah, I'm guessing that too. All right, so the next thing you want to do is count the otoliths, which are ear stones. Now, if you had rulers with you, I would ask you to measure the length of the otolith. And on page 7, you would then compare the length of the otolith to the chart on page 7 and find out what the length of the fish was. Chart on page 7. That's nice linear, linear and then you would use the chart on page 8 to determine the weight of this particular fish. Obviously, if you were working with the younger grades, you might want to simplify this exercise. Since we're working with fully formed adults, I don't feel the need to do that today. <laughs> now, the obvious question that somebody should be asking right now is, if I only had one fisheye, how can I have multiple otoliths? And I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Maybe they have eight fish eaters. You're talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> asking that very question. Two seals had a fight over one fish. Two fish on first scat. That's fine. That's fine. Scat samples, but there may have been 15 scat samples from that one. Right. That's, that's um, the, the, the explanation that we have from our scat expert here in Newark is that it is likely that, and he's by the way called a scatologist in case any of you wondered. Um, what, what he suggests is that when sea lions relieve themselves, um, they may not do it all in one portion of scat. How's that? And so that you might have to look at a number of portions of scat to get some of this information. So how long are our fish? How big are these fish that we're finding? I don't know if anyone has a millimeter ruler in front of them. Because I know I carry one with me wherever I go. <laughs> that was somebody I knew laughing because they know it's true, wasn't it? Um, yeah. No, we were laughing about something independent. <laughs> oh, OK. Probably. Now, you're not in sixth grade, so the word scat shouldn't make you laugh. But it kind of does. <laughs> <laughs> that was Matt. Was that Bill that I heard saying that? Could be. Okay, well, can I ask another obvious question since we're just dancing around? Shut up, sure. What somebody do if they schedule a class like this? What are they doing? Do they reschedule it if there's technical difficulties? Is, is, no, they dance. I have never known them 
to have this level of technical difficulties. Generally, when I have tried to reach Rachel, she's been act actively involved in an exercise like this. Um, I do not know why we're having these technical difficulties. My assumption is that you would reschedule this and that what you would probably try to do is have another lesson plan sitting waiting just in case you couldn't get the network connections made. You also probably would have asked Rachel, which I don't know if we did, to try to connect into the system an hour in advance. Now, obviously, time of day has something to do with it. it uh, Seward, Alaska is four hours earlier than us. Yes. So we're at about 2 o'clock, so she's at about 10 o'clock right now. We probably would have asked her to come into work a little bit early to get things set up. This would be less of a problem if you had control over the video conferencing, if you were working with faculty at your own institution, because you would have plenty of time to test out the equipment in advance. Besides Alaska Sea Life, there are probably hundreds of other research centers around the world that have similar kinds of activities, and they're worth looking into. Um, a lot of good websites, and if you're, very, if you're interested, send me email at gstein at rectors.edu, and I'll find the list of centers that I've uh, bookmarked <coughs> that list lots of places that you could go to to find these kinds of activities. What we're hoping to do in New Jersey is to actually be able to set up something similar within the state so that you know that if you want an exercise on black bears, let's say, that you could go to this particular institution and you could learn about black bears. Or if you're inter interested in learning more about George Washington and his crossing of the Delaware, you could go to a particular site that would talk about the crossing of the Delaware, maybe show a movie of the, the um, recreations that they do every December. If anybody here at Rutgers in particular is interested in developing a program like this, please also get in touch with me and I'll work with you as best as I can to make a program successful. Obviously, the video conferencing today has made this not as successful as I would have liked. Yes. Yes. Are they? They might not be at, on Internet 2, as you're saying. They're connecting with IP and ISDN connections. So they may not be on Internet 2. I thought they were. Well, if they, if they do IP, then, then that would cover it if they do have connectivity to i but, but it's not clear. Mm -hmm. Very soon. The Alaska Sea Life Center um, charges money for these activities, um, as their brochure shows mostly to recoup the costs that are involved in doing this. They have the materials that they have to print out, the shipping that they have to take care of, the use of staff resources to do this. Uh, so their costs are, are actually fairly low for these kinds of activities, but there are costs. So for those of you who, ha who don't have the Alaska Sea Life Center brochure in front of you, they have activities on tide pools and cephalopods. One of my favorite titles is Eat or Be Eaten in Alaska. And they talk about whales and sea lions, careers in marine science, things like this. Fish. 
if you know what the, if you, okay, if you know what the otolith length is, let's say it's 10 millimeters, you would go up to the line and you would know that the length of the fish was 20 centimeters. So there's no calculation involved. You just go up and look at the line. The line's been, been determined by ranges of experiments that they've done. So these are your otoliths from the pollock. How long are our fish? New Brunswick, do we know? 25 centimeters. Somebody, okay, can somebody do the math really quickly about how many inches is that for those of us who don't think in metric? 2.54 centimeters to an inch. Okay, finish doing the math, please. Almost 10. 10 inches. I don't, okay, so that's about a 10 inch fish, that's about Yo big. New Brunswick, do we have a fish length? 20 centimeters also. 20 centimeters also. About to, okay, so so the fish are about the same size. Now, based on the, the length the of the same fish, fish. <laughs> I'm sorry? Maybe it's the same no, I didn't fish. Exclude Newark. I think Newark has has you have I'm sorry. How long are the fish in Newark? I'm sure the fish in New York are 20 inches. <laughs> 21 centimeters. Okay. 26 centimeter fish, so New York has the longest fish. Now let's go to page eight and see how much the fish likely weighed. So if you were going out fishing, how tough would it be to land one of these fish? I'm not thinking a lot. Looks like uh, for the 20 centimeter fish, it looks like the weight is virtually nothing. Yeah. And for the 26 inch fish, it looks like the 12, 12, I'm sorry, 12 ounces, yes. So you can divide this up into ounces if you are as knowledgeable as my colleague here, uh, Ken. And that's hampered by, yes, I understand that. <coughs> so about 12 ounces, so it's a fish that's a little bit less than a pound. So these are fairly small fish. They wouldn't be very hard for you to land. Obviously, they're not very difficult for the, um, for the sea lions to eat. But I do believe that these fish have gotten smaller over time based on what I've read about the sea lion population. Sea lions are very, stellar sea lions are very important to the Alaska economy. And so having smaller sea lions, having fewer sea lions has a, a direct effect on the economy of, the, of Alaska. Okay, so does anybody have any questions that I can't answer? <laughs> yes. What's the meaning of life? Well, you're very welcome. I tried as much as I could. Um, I will see if at some other time I can manage to, uh, to actually get Alaska Sea Life Center to connect to us and we can try it again. Um, but in the meantime, I've done my absolute best. It is much more interesting when you can actually see the Alaska Sea Life Center and they can show you the aquaria and they can show you the sea lions and things like that. Obviously, for, uh, by the way, I was just waving at one of the people in Newark who was leaving, in case you wondered why I was waving. Um, it wasn't to say goodbye to all of you, although that was coming soon. So anyway, the purpose of this, um, this somewhat bizarre demonstration was to say, we can do this here at Rutgers, we can do this here in New Jersey. We've got plenty of opportunities through places like our Marine Science Center. Uh, research centers, other kinds of places to reach out. Another program that you might be interested in in New Jersey is called Science in the Cinema. It's a fabulous program. Science in the Cinema, basically you would show a movie to your class, perhaps Aaron Brockovich, and then you would bring into the class, either using video conferencing technology or otherwise, who would perhaps talk about the toxicology and whether it was true and other kinds of topics related to a movie that has science in it.
Aaron Brockovich is the one that comes to mind because it's the one that I know that, that they've been working with. Jurassic Park, Lorenzo Soil. So if there's a particular movie that fits into the discipline that you teach, that you think might be relevant for an audience like this, we can work on a science in the cinema or a humanities or social science in the cinema program, working with the people in um, NJ Edge who've gotten involved with this. If you are from K through 12, there's a wonderful man named Matt Conforth who teaches at Passaic Valley High School. Matt is the biggest proponent for linking up K-12 with higher education that I've ever met. And I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about what they're doing at Passaic Valley and what other opportunities are available. Any last questions? Okay, thank you very much. We will see you all at 2.30 for our next session. Thank you, Gail. Thanks, Gail. Thank I'd appreciate it. Just put them back in the envelopes and get them back to me at some point. Thank you. Should we be reclaiming the scat as well? <laughs> <laughs> Our scat is scattered. What do we do now?